any case, just know, today, next Sunday, and the following Sunday, um, we'll put a pause on the book of Hebrews, and then we'll, Lord willing, jump back into it. Or, you know, we could be raptured, and that'd be great, and then we don't have to continue. And then we'll be standing in front of the king of the Hebrews, and the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. So, now, if you will, get your Bibles open to John chapter 12. This is going to be our main um, text today. But as you, if you've got the announcements, you see there are several others. And again, we are a fellowship, we're a church, we're a body of uh, believers who gather together, who love to study the Word of God, and we allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. And so I think it's important to always give you scriptural evidence for some of the things we're going to be looking at. But this is what we're going to be looking at, the major event, Palm Sunday. And to give you some context, before we jump into chapter 12, I just want to tell you what's happening in this chapter, summarize it, and then we'll move forward. A few days, or actually a couple days before Palm Sunday, Jesus arrived at Bethany, at the house of Mary and Martha, also the house of Lazarus, their brother. He arrives there, and of course, we see this amazing thing where, you know, Mary and Martha are doing their thing. Now, remember, there's a famous story earlier where Martha was serving tables and Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning and worshiping Jesus, and Martha was complaining. Lord, make her get up and help me. (laughs) And the Lord rebuked her lovingly and said, Mary has chosen the greater thing. And there's a lot in that. And and sometimes, you know, we beat up on poor Martha and we we say this is great for Mary. And it's true. There's something to be learned there. Um, But there's also a time to serve and there's a time to worship. Don't serve so much much that you miss the worship, and don't worship so much and be so super spiritual that you, it gets you out of work. You know what I mean? There is a balance. But anyway, but that's what we know. But now we're seeing in this chapter 12, the leading up to Palm Sunday, Jesus has arrived at their home, and they're serving him. And it's this beautiful thing because Martha is serving him dinner, doing what she's called to do. And Mary is sitting at his feet worshiping him. It's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful picture, really, of the church. But among them, there's also another person there, we find out in chapter 12, and it's Judas, right? And I feel like we should have music. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) But Judas is there, and what is he doing? Oh, remember, Mary, part of the act of worship, she takes this uh, costly oil, spikenard. It's worth 300 denarii. That's a year's wages. Okay? She takes this and she starts pouring it on the feet of Jesus, wiping it with her hair. And what does Judas say? Hey, what is she doing? You know, he, he discounts the act of worship and he makes it all about him. What is she doing, even though he's trying to act super spiritual? She should have sold that. We should have sold that and given the money to the poor. This is what Judas is saying. But we know his real heart. It was all about him. He didn't care about the poor. He didn't care about anybody but Judas. And the Bible even tells us that he was a thief. He would steal from the coffers. And so understand, sometimes we have that element. There's always tares among the wheat, right? Don't let that distract you from serving the Lord. There's always going to be issues. And even other Christians are challenging at times. Amen? No, don't say that. Uh, but, But it's true. But serve, like Mary and Martha, do what you're called to do. Serve the Lord. And it's a beautiful thing. But there in the midst of the house was also this man, Lazarus. And understand, this is leading up to the Feast of Passover. And so now we know all of the people from all over Israel are arriving in Jerusalem. We know it was more than a million people on average would come to Jerusalem for the week for Passover week. And so many people were traveling on the roads. And here's the thing. Lazarus had become famous because Jesus raised him from the dead. So there were lots of people who wanted to get selfies with him. You know, (laughs) Truly, not that, but they, they really wanted to meet him. They wanted to meet Lazarus because they heard that he had been raised from the dead. And it was a powerful witness of Jesus' ministry. But because of that, the chief priests, who already wanted to plot to kill Jesus, now they're really going to plot to kill Jesus. But understand, they also wanted to murder Lazarus, the proof of his ministry. That's what we're finding out in chapter 12. They wanted to kill Jesus, but they also wanted to kill Lazarus. And many times in the world, that's what we see too. They not only want to try to destroy our faith, but they want to destroy any work we do. Stay faithful. Stay on task. Keep your eyes on Jesus, not on man. Do what you're called to do. And so this is the background for Palm Sunday, for the triumphal entry, it's also called. This Passover week is starting to happen, and thousands upon thousands of people are flooding into that area. But then we read this. John 12, verses 12 through 16 The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it. As it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Let's pray. Father, this is your word. And as we come together today on this beautiful day to remember this wonderful action of our Lord, of our Savior, of riding this donkey into Jerusalem to declare himself Messiah, Lord, help us to to be reminded, Lord, of how much you love us and how much the Lord loved us so much that he was willing to take that journey down the Mount of Olives into the city and then eventually up the hill of Golgotha to die for our sins. Lord, help us to be reminded of your beautiful grace, your beautiful mercy, and all the love you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. And so after spending a couple days in Bethany at this house with his friends, with his dear ones, these friends, these people that were like family, his disciples, Jesus knows his time is drawing near. He knows And just so you know, this event, Palm Sunday, is one of those rare events that we find not only in the Synoptic Gospels, but here in John as well. All four Gospels have a rendering, a teaching, a description of this wonderful event, the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. And so you can draw a lot from the Scripture, and you can understand and get a, a, a larger context. But also know this, Jesus was very intentional about making this prophecy happen. Some critics of the Bible say, well, yeah, he could have made this prophecy happen. True to some degree, right? He could have chosen, which he did, to ride a donkey into the city of Jerusalem on any day he chose to. So that is true. But to make people spontaneously worship him, (laughs) thousands of people, to cry out Hosanna, Hosanna, that takes divine intervention. And there are many prophecies in Scripture where he couldn't have had any help other than divine intervention, other than being who he is, where he was born. I don't know. How many in here, as... as, uh, uh, babies in their mom's stomach decided where they were going to be born. Just raise your hand. I mean, maybe there's some of you. I don't know. But um, you can't decide where you're going to be born. And you can't decide when you're going to be born or who your parents are and all the lineage and all these things. Not only that, but Jesus, I, I, I have a hard time believing that he lined up everything so he could be crucified on a certain day on a cross that was prophesied. And then not only that, that the soldiers would gamble over his clothing or that he'd be resurrected on a certain day. All of these things, many of those prophecies we know, have divine origin. And even this one does. But he definitely was intentional about it. We find that out in Matthew. Matthew 21, verse 1 through 4, the first part of verse 4. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. And so, no, Jesus didn't tell him to go steal a donkey. (laughs) That's not what's being said. Obviously, the Lord had uh, arranged this beforehand. Whoever this was, the Lord had arranged it. Because, again, he knew his time was drawing near. And this also shows that, you know, this day Jesus had been looking forward to, he knew. He knew what he was going to have to do. Remember this. They, every single time Jesus was with a crowd and they tried to raise him up as Messiah or some political leader, he got out of there. He rebuked them and he got out of there. But now he knows he is finally going to present himself as Messiah. He is going to present himself to Israel as their king, as their Messiah. He knows time has come. But understand this, the Jewish people were were somewhat confused in understanding Messiah himself. They felt as if it was taught, the rabbinical teachings taught that perhaps there were two messiahs because they couldn't line up scripture. They couldn't reconcile the fact that he seemed to be a suffering servant and a ruling king. They saw it in scripture, but they didn't recognize it. And so they came up with these terms, Messiah ben Joseph. They believed there was one called Messiah ben Joseph who would be the suffering servant. They also believed in one called Messiah ben David, the ruling king. And they didn't know how to reconcile it. But the one they focused on Guess which one they focused on, the ruling king, the military leader, the one that would come in this way. Because here's the thing, you can't really blame them. After all the tyranny and the persecution they had experienced under Rome's heavy hand, they wanted political victory. They weren't looking for spiritual victory. 
They wanted earthly victory. They wanted an earthly king. They wanted that. They, they weren't looking to the spiritual, to the eternal. But Jesus is now going to present them or present himself to them in a way they had not wanted, that they had not imagined. He's not coming as a military leader. Not that time. He's not coming as a military leader who will overthrow Rome or bring glory to Israel. He's not arriving on a white stallion or a war horse. That's next time. <laughs> He's not doing that. He's riding. He chose to ride a simple donkey, a simple beast of burden that in those days was a sign of peace, not war. Morrison, in his commentary, says this, The donkey was not normally used by a warlike person. It was the animal of a man of peace, a priest, a merchant, or the like. It might also be used as a person of importance, but in connection with peaceful purposes. A conqueror would ride into the city on a war horse, or perhaps march in on foot at the head of his troops. The donkey speaks of peace. Merrill Tenney, in his commentary, said this, He did not come as a conqueror. But as a messenger of peace, he rode on a donkey, not the steed of royalty, but that of a commoner on a business trip. Jesus came humbly, lowly on a donkey. And, you know, I mentioned this when we went through the Gospel of Mark. I want to mention it again today. I think it's, it's, it's very uh, fitting to mention it on Palm Sunday. But, you know, the donkey is a remarkable creature. They're amazing. And when you look at their fur, every donkey has the shape of a cross in its fur. And I've talked about this before, but I love it. Every single donkey has the shape of a cross on its fur. And some claim I'm reading too much into it. Go ahead and show that slide, Kevin. Get that slide. Okay. Now, I just want you to hear me out. Look at these pictures, and I just want you to hear my logic and hear what I have to say before you just throw this aside. For those who think I'm reading too much into it, I would say to you, maybe you're not reading enough into it. Now listen to this. Who created the donkey? <laughs> I mean, we know from John chapter 1, and we know from Hebrews chapter 1, Jesus created all things, and he holds all things together by the power of his word. So I'll ask you again, who created the donkey? Jesus Christ. Who gave Zechariah the prophecy that Messiah would ride on a donkey, that he would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey? The word made flesh, the logos. Okay. Who actually rode the donkey? I know these aren't tough questions. Who actually rode the donkey into Jerusalem declaring himself Messiah? Jesus, the same one who created it. And so again, if you think I'm reading too much into it, think about this. Think of the coincidence it would have to be where Jesus is riding that donkey and go, Oh, look at that. It's the shape of a cross. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> or is there something bigger going on? You know, the Bible says that all of creation declares his glory. So people can say what they want. I just know there's a cross on the back of a donkey, every single donkey, and it points to something beautiful. But understand now Jesus is riding this donkey down the, the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem as proof that he is coming in peace, but they wanted a military leader. And as proof that we know they wanted a military leader is understand this. They're throwing down palm branches and waving palm branches. Understand where this tradition came from. This came from the time of the Maccabees, from the Maccabean revolt. This tradition of waving palm branches and laying down palm branches in the street came after a military victory where they were waving them during the Maccabean revolt. And if you know anything about that, we studied this out when we went through Daniel. The Maccabees, during, it was 167 B.C., roughly, was when it started. What happened was a man named Antiochus Epiphanes, this man who thought he was God, defiled the temple, slaughtered a pig, put an idol in the Holy of Holies, did these horrible things, and the Maccabees, Judah the Hammer, literally is his name, the Maccabees led this revolt. They fought for many seasons and finally had victory. And this miracle happened. An amazing thing, because they had to rededicate the temple to cleanse it, but they only had enough oil for one day. But we know what happened. The Lord allowed that oil to burn for eight days and eight nights, right? It was this beautiful miracle. And then that's how the holiday Hanukkah, that's where it came from, the Feast of Dedication. But understand, after victory, after they had victory, this is where the tradition came from. They waved these palm branches and laid them out in front of the, the victorious armies. That's where this came from. And so that's what we're seeing on Palm Sunday. Now, the supply of date palms, those branches, it's still prevalent. It's still widely available in Israel. It was then. It is now. But that's what they were doing. And they're crying out, Hosanna, verse 13. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And that's crucial. Hear their expectations. Hosanna, which means 
Salvation, give salvation now, but what kind of salvation? In Hebrew, they're crying out, Baruch Abba, Bashem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, but why? Why are they wanting blessing? Understand, this came from one of the Hillel Psalms, one of the Psalms that they sing during the Passover Seder. Also, Psalm 118 is where this comes from. This is amazing too, because during Passover week, the temple choir had songs they would sing every morning to start the morning. They would sing Psalm 118. That was their tradition. It's one of the Hillel Psalms as well. So Psalm 118 is where they get this. And this is verse 25 and 26. It says this, Save now, I pray, O Lord, O Lord, I pray. Send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. Understand this. They're quoting this from Psalm 118. And we know this, this word for salvation in John 12 comes from that Hebrew word yasha, which means to be made free, to be delivered, to be defended, or to have victory. That's what they were looking for, not spiritual salvation. See, we take it for granted. In our modern vernacular, we, as Christians, we have Christianese, right? We have this language. We understand what salvation means. They had never had Messiah come. They didn't know about this. And so their salvation was mostly, even though there was a spiritual aspect to it, it was mostly about the here and now, about being saved. They wanted victory. They wanted to be set free and delivered from Rome, those who, with their oppressive rule of government. Their motivation was mostly worldly. The people were missing what Jesus was offering. They would have understood if they have just backed up a few verses in Psalm 118 and read this, verse 22 and 23. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. We know that Jesus just four days later would be rejected by the whole congregation of Israel. By Israel, he would be rejected as their Messiah and their king. Their expectations were all wrong. And I wonder if we can't fall into this same trap these days. You know, I wonder what our expectations are for the Lord, what we desire of him. What are, what are our prayers as the people of God? Are they eternally focused? Are they focused on him and his purpose, his kingdom, or are they here and now? I think this is a great day to remind ourselves of that, to refocus, if you will, on the King of kings and the Lord of lords and what he would have each one of us do. We're not to build up our own little kingdoms on this planet. We're in this world, we're not of it. We're to build his kingdom. We're to have him in focus. We're to do his will. So do we also miss what the Lord would say to us or have us do? Do we pray with the wrong motivations? So these people, they wanted a military leader. They wanted Messiah ben David, a king. Remember Israel's crux, their biggest flaw was what? They wanted a king, not God. God said, I want to be your ruler, your king. And they said, no, we want a king. Give us a king like the other pagan nations. God gave them a king, and they're still desiring a king. They wanted somebody who would cast off the shackles of Rome, establish the kingdom of Israel, and give them freedom and victory. But Jesus came as a man of peace. He's declaring, I am a man of peace, to offer his life as the perfect sacrificial lamb, to save them from the shackles of sin and death, and to give them eternal victory. That's what his focus was. And we all know it was part of God's perfect plan. And understand this, and I'm not going to belabor it today. <laughs> You're probably going to say thank you, but here's the thing. Because math gets confusing for a lot of people. But this happened exactly to the day it was predicted. Palm Sunday, the day Jesus rode that donkey into Jerusalem, happened exactly on the day that was prophesied by the prophet Daniel. Half a century before Jesus' time. We know it's in Daniel chapter 9, that 70-week prophecy that we talked about. Seventy weeks were allotted Israel to bring about their completion, to bring about righteousness. But we know it was divided into two. The first 483 years, so it's 70 years of weeks, 70 times 7 is 490 years. We know it was divided into the first 483 years and the last seven. This is why many of us who are pre-tribulation, pre-millennial, we believe that last seven years is allotted to God dealing with Israel corporately because there's still seven years on the prophetic calendar where God is going to bring about their completion and their righteousness. That is the tribulation. But the first 483 years are already fulfilled. Understand, on a Hebrew calendar, when you take 483 years and you times it by 360 days, you get 173,880 days. Stay with me. Okay? 173,880 days. And the prophecy was from the declaring 
to rebuild and restore Jerusalem from that day until Messiah the Prince, until he came, until he was cut off, that literally means to be executed, would be 173,880 days. Well, guess what? From Scripture, we know when the decree was given by Artaxerxes Longimanus, we know it was given on March 14th, 445 B.C., we know this from Scripture. And when you overlay 173,880 days, starting at March 14th, 445 B.C., and you adjust the calendar accordingly, it lands on a day, April 6th, 32 A.D. And you might say, so? <laughs> that happens to be Palm Sunday. Just think about this for a second. To the day. Our Lord is perfect to the day, everything he does is to the day. The day he rode that donkey into Jerusalem is the day that was prophesied in Daniel. The Messiah would be cut off. And here's what we know. He presents himself as Messiah, and four days later, he would be cut off. They would reject him. They rejected him as Messiah. But this is the exact day that he rode this donkey. Again, God's word is so perfect. He rode into Jerusalem on that exact day. But not only that, understand this. According to the book of Exodus, that day, April 6, 32 AD, lines up with another day, the 10th day of Nisan. And not the car, okay? It's the month, first month of the year, okay? 10th day of Nisan on the Hebrew calendar. And this was exact for a reason as well. Because that is the day that Israel, everybody in Israel was to select a Passover lamb for their own sacrifice. They were to select a lamb on the 10th day of Nisan, and they were to then inspect it for four days. But listen, Exodus 12, uh, verse 3. This is what was commanded Israel. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying on the 10th of this month, that's the 10th of Nisan in the context, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And this is how they were to determine it in verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. But then here's where it gets interesting. They were to keep that lamb and inspect it for four days. They were in, to inspect it for any flaw, any blemish for four days until the 14th day of Nisan, which is Passover. Until Passover. And if it's found without spot or blemish, they would have it sacrificed. Exodus 12, 6. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Wow. Wow. And so again, you might be saying, okay, so what? Well, if you study this out, and we did when we went through the Gospel of Mark, but when you study this out and you realize the feasts of the Lord are just that. Those are Levitical feasts, those feasts given to Israel, they're not the feasts of Israel, they're the feast of the Lord. Those seven feasts, which is Passover, unleavened bread, first fruit, Shavuot, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. Every one of those are the feasts of the Lord, and every single one of those declares the glory of God and points to Jesus Christ. When we go through that Seder, you'll see how it all points to him. Every one of these feasts point to him, to the day, to the very day. And that's when we realize, wait a second, Jesus had to be crucified then on Passover. If God's going to be exact, he had to be crucified on Nisan 14. Folks, I believe he was crucified on Nisan 14. And before, you know, you say, yeah, sounds good. Understand, that's a Thursday. But I want to show you why there's confusion. And just hear me out. We don't have to agree on this. I just want you to study it for yourself. Test what I'm saying here today. Write it down. Go home and test it. Understand the confusion comes because Thursday is when he was crucified, I believe, on Passover, the exact day that Scripture declares. But his body was not placed in the tomb until the next day, until after sundown. This is crucial to understand. If you study this out, understand, a Hebrew day does not start at midnight like ours or in the morning when the light comes up. A Hebrew day on their calendar starts when the sun goes down. So understand, if the Lord lined up with the feasts of Passover, if this is truly God's word is perfect and Passover was created to point to Jesus, he would be crucified on Nisan 14 Thursday. But understand, his body was not placed in the tomb until after sundown which made it Friday. There's something amazing going on here. Let me read. And by the way, that Friday is the 15th of Nisan. It's also a special day. It's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Leaven is a picture and type of sin. Here's the thing about Jesus. He's the bread that come down from heaven with no sin. Unleavened bread. His body, 
not his soul, his body would have been placed in the tomb on the 15th day of Nisan, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But he would have been crucified on Passover, Nisan 14, which is Thursday. Let me show you some evidence. You're like, about time. Matthew 27, 57 through 60. We get one of the passages that explain this to us. Remember, Jesus has now been crucified. He is, he is on the cross. His body is dead. He's hanging on the cross. And we read this, verses 57 through 60. Now when evening had come, understand this means a lot to the Hebrew people because that means a brand new day has started. Whatever day he was crucified on, now the sun has gone down. It's a different day in Israel, period. There's no, you can't finagle this. Now when evening had come, here came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock and rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. Again, this is why it's confusing. I believe God's word is perfect. I don't believe he missed the Passover by one day. I believe Jesus was crucified on Nisan 14, exactly how the scripture proclaimed. But this is why it's confusing, because after the sun went down, his body was still on the cross on Friday, on the Hebrew calendar, and was placed in the tomb on a Friday. But here's what we know. Jesus rode that donkey, just as scripture said. He rode it into Jerusalem to be inspected on Nisan 10, Sunday, Palm Sunday. Just as the Bible declared, he was inspected for four days by the whole congregation of Israel and rejected and executed. He was killed on Passover. And then his body hung on the cross until the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They took his body off of the cross and put it into the tomb on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is really remarkable when you study it out. Consider it. Think about it. This is our perfect God. Because the timeline would be this. He would ride in, just as Exodus says, on the 10th of Nisan. He'd be inspected for four days. He'd be rejected and crucified on Thursday, the 14th of Nisan, on Passover. His body would then be placed in the tomb on the 15th, on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And he would raise from the dead on the 17th of Nisan, which is also the Feast of First Fruits. This is how perfect our God is, how perfect his word is. Now, Mark 15 gives us even more insight into this and understand this is where we, we can give even more evidence. Because if he was crucified on a Friday, if he was crucified on a Friday, and again, this is not to be contentious. I want you to see how perfect his word is. If the Lord was crucified on a Friday, and he's crucified, and then it turns another day, what day would that be if the sun went down? Saturday. What day is that for the Jews? Sabbath. That's Shabbat. Understand, if he was crucified on a Friday, and then night came, which we'll find out, just like we did in Matthew, that's what happened, then his body would have had to be removed on the Sabbath. That didn't happen. Instead, it was removed on the preparation day because Thursday is Passover. When the night came, it became Friday, which is the day before the weekly Sabbath, which is also called the preparation day. Mark 15, 42 through 46. Now, when evening had come, so it's now Friday, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead. Sometimes these victims of crucifixion would take days to die. But Jesus died the same day. And now his body is just on the cross. And summoning the centurion, he asked him if it had, he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he brought, uh, bought fine linen, took him down, wrapped him in the linen, and he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Again, I don't want to keep belaboring it, but I will. Because God's word is so perfect. And I'm telling you, I just want you to embrace this in a way and go study it out yourself. Go study it out. Tell me what you find, because here's the thing. I am so confident in his word, not in my teaching. I am so confident in everything he says that every single feast points to Jesus, points to Yeshua. He didn't miss it by one day. I, I refuse to believe that. He rode in on that day, on the 10th of Nisan, to be inspected. He was crucified on Passover, 
which by the way, it lines up with everything else too, because we think of it as Wednesday night, that Jesus had his, his Passover Seder with his disciples on Wednesday night, but that was after sunset on Wednesday, which is what? Thursday on the Hebrew calendar. He has his Passover Seder. He goes into the garden. He is arrested. He goes through the trial, and he's crucified all on that day because of the Hebrew calendar from sundown to sundown. And then his body is placed in the tomb on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Remember, he is the bread come down from heaven. And remember, in the Passover Seder, he broke that bread, offered it to his disciples, and said, Here, take, this is my body, which is offered, which is broken for you. He is the bread come down from heaven, and it only fits perfectly. But not only that, this also fulfills Jesus' own words, his own prophecy. And I'm sorry, but I cannot believe that Jesus missed it by a day either. I can't believe that Jesus would be wrong in a prophecy, but that's what I've been taught my whole life. Because Jesus said he would be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. That doesn't work with a Friday crucifixion. It only works with a Passover crucifixion. Three days and three nights. And where did he go? And we're talking about his soul. So understand this. When Christ died, he gave up his spirit, right? His soul went into the belly of the earth, into the center of the earth. We know from other passages of scripture, Jesus told about this, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. This rich man went to hell, went to Hades, the portion of Sheol, this place that was designated as hell. There was a great chasm between that and this place called paradise, Abraham's bosom. Before the cross, that's where those who died in faith went to be comforted. And they were held there until the resurrection, until Jesus Christ took captivity captive, took him to the Father. And now when we die, we go directly to the Father. And now hell is expanded. The belly of the earth is all hell now. We know that from Scripture. Again, go study it out. Go test it. But we know his soul, as soon as he died, went into the heart of the earth. Ephesians 4, 7 through 9 says this, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. We get more insight from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Again, go study it out. This is where he went. Three days and three nights in the belly of the earth, in the heart of the earth. And we know this is what Jesus told us in Matthew twelve forty. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I'm sorry, but Jesus didn't miss it by a day. I can't. The word is perfect. He said what he meant, and he meant what he said. Again, we don't have to agree on these things. Don't let it be a contention. I just want you to study it out. Because to me, the more I study it out, the more my faith grows. He's the God of gods. He is the King of kings. He's the one before all time. He had all of this planned out to the very day. And it all declares him. So I can't agree when people say close enough. But I understand the confusion when we talk about a Friday because Friday was involved. I believe he was crucified on that Thursday and his body placed in the tomb on a Friday in the Hebrew calendar. And so we know Jesus arrived perfectly on time. He rode that donkey into Jerusalem on the 10th day of Nisan. But here's what I love. You know, even though they missed it, they wanted a political leader, they wanted a king who would tear down the tyranny. What they were missing was the beauty of why Jesus came the first time. True salvation. He came because he loved us so much. We know John 3.16. God so loved us that he sent his only son. But John 3.17, I've, I've talked about this recently. It is so powerful. And sometimes we just, we, we move past it too quickly. For God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Thank God he didn't come on a war horse the first time. None of us would be here today. How much love does it take 
for the king of the universe to step off his throne and to walk among humanity, to live in a frail body and to go through what we go through, to walk among those people who despised him mostly, who hated him, who spit on him, who ripped his beard, who treated him like absolute garbage. How much love does it take? How much love does he have for you, for each one of us? I don't care where you're at today in your walk with the Lord, as long as you're walking with him, but this is what I do care about. Let the love of Christ compel you. Know how much he loves you and the grace he gave us all. Live a life pleasing to your Lord, not out of legalism, but out of gratitude and sheer love. That's what he did in word and deed. He showed us how much he loved us, not just in words. Oh, I love Jesus. How about actions? Show him how much you love him today. Spend time with your king. Spend time in his word. Spend time in prayer. Dote on him. Get to know him. Fall in love with Jesus all over again, or maybe for the first time, because he loves you. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. And so on his first journey here, he didn't come to overthrow the shackles of tyrannical government or to set up his earthly kingdom. He came to seek and save the lost. He came to be offered as the perfect sacrificial Passover lamb. But just like us many times, or maybe like me, not you, the disciples really didn't understand what was going on. Hindsight's twenty twenty, verse 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. And that's why, you know, it's so amazing having the scripture because we can go back in, we can dive back in, and we can see everything. We have such a beautiful history of what happened. They didn't have this, those poor disciples. They didn't have all of this. But then Jesus is going to tell them more of why he came, verse 24 through 26. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. And I love this because I talked about this perfect, beautiful example early on of Mary and Martha finally getting it. And I love this because when you look at this, it's the combination of of service, of serving the Lord, word and deed, of faith and action. That word, when he says, if anyone serves me, I love it because that word literally means to serve tables. And that's what we see with Martha serving the Lord, serving tables. It's a beautiful reflection. And then when he says, and follow, it says, That means to be in unity or in agreement. And that's what Mary was doing in her worship at his feet. Mary and Martha, word and deed, faith and action. That's what the Lord desires of us. And he led by example. He is the perfect example of word and deed, of faith and action. He did it for us. We ought to do it for him. And he continues to explain this. And now something amazing happens. Something that people don't really talk about. We talk about that the Father spoke at the baptism of Jesus. We talk about that a lot, but sometimes this gets overlooked. The Father's going to speak from heaven as Jesus explains something. Verse 27 and 28, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. I love this because where it says I came to this hour, that term, it literally means it's a fixed time on the calendar and you can't go back from that moment. It's set in stone. But I love this. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. I have glorified it in the life of Jesus and I will glorify it again in the death of Jesus. That's what he's pointing to. But understand this. Some of the people who are standing there, he's talking to his disciples, but some of the people who are standing there couldn't hear the voice of God. Verse 29, therefore the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. They weren't quite sure what was said. Remember what Jesus said in two chapters earlier in John chapter 10. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Now his disciples heard, but others around there seemingly couldn't hear. And I just want to challenge you today because I want to ask you the question. 
Are you hearing from God? Well, he doesn't speak to me. Yes, he does. He speaks to everyone. I mentioned it earlier, even all creation declares his glory. But he speaks to everyone. Well, how does he speak? In various ways. One of my favorite, you know my, the saying I love, if you haven't heard God speak recently, just open the Bible and read it out loud. It's all his word. But not only that, when's the last time you really spent time alone with him? Develop that relationship and spent time praying to him and not just seeking things, but just asking him, Lord, what will we do? What do you want me to do? Lord, speak to me. Not only that, but sometimes my wife sounds an awful lot like the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and other people can too. Those people in your life, when they're speaking things and it pierces your heart, you know it's from the Lord. Don't be offended when those things pierce your heart, when you know it's true. Stop and just say, Lord, I take it, I receive it. And God, help me in this moment because I can't change me. You change me. But listen for the voice of God. He wants to spend time with you. And here's what happens. Many times just the cares of the world drown out the voice of God in our lives. We get so caught up in the here and now. We get so caught up in all the troubles and all the things we're going through. I, you know, this week, I, I've heard from a lot of you, you're going through a lot. We've been going through a lot. Seems like whenever ministry is advancing and we're getting close to breakthroughs and all these things are happening, man, the enemy doesn't like it, but we just stay faithful. We just keep looking to the Lord. Just keep looking to the one who loves you. Keep looking to the one who will never let you down. He'll never fail you no matter what you're going through. Drown out the stuff of this world and focus on your king, on the one who loves you with an everlasting love, the one who died for you, the one who rode this donkey into Jerusalem with us in mind. And I love this because it finishes, we're going to finish with verse 31 through 33. Jesus explains, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. He's a defeated foe. He's a defeated foe. And remember, when the enemy tries to remind you of your past, you just remind him of his future. Because he's already defeated. Our king is one. And I, if I am lifted up, Jesus said, from the earth will draw all people to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. Pointing to the cross. It wasn't an afterthought. And next week, we're going to look at the center of our faith. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what it means. Do you understand the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the center of everything we believe? It's the validation of who he is and who we are. Without the resurrection, we don't have Christianity. And the resurrection in and of itself is a beautiful promise. It's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful thing. And I can't wait to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But today, consider these things, that God's word is perfect. He rode that donkey into Jerusalem on the exact day. He was crucified on the exact day. His body was placed in the tomb on the exact day. And next week, we'll see, he was resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits, the exact day prophesied. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. He is everything we have or ever will need. He's your king. Amen. And so today, let your heart cry be Hosanna. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And know this, your king is coming. He's coming. Your king is going to come get us someday soon. Until then, do what he did. Be faithful in word and deed. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your beautiful word that is perfect. And Lord, there is none like you. And we are not worthy, but you have made us worthy. And you love us beyond anything we can ever imagine or understand. Each one of us, no matter how difficult we are, you love us. And so God, change us from the inside out. Help us to be those you want us to be. Help us to serve you in word and deed. Help us to live out our faith like never before. God, pour out your spirit upon our fellowship, upon our people, upon the people who, who are watching. Lord, pour out your spirit and do a beautiful work in us and through us. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for Golgotha. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us and continue to do. We praise you and we honor you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the name that is above all names, we pray. Amen.